What is going on, Hot Take Nation? It is DRW here for another episode of Hot Take of the Day podcast. And uh, as you know, I'm trying to branch out a little way from energy because energy is sort of like the most depressing topic in the history of the universe. The only thing more depressing would be to talk about politics. And so today we're going to talk about accelerating your startup. And I think in the context of pivoting careers and thinking about what it is that's coming next, obviously capital providing is a huge business. It's a huge undertaking. And for those companies that find companies and help accelerate them to the next level, it's a big deal. So today I am joined by Brian McMahon, who uh, is with the Expert Dojo. Now, Dojo is capitalized. I have lots of questions about it. Why don't you start with telling us about your company, your firm, and where the name came from? Hey, David, great to be here. And uh, yeah, Expert Dojo is kind of a fun name. I, so my, my kid used to, was in school. I, I actually, so first of all, what do we do? We're an accelerator, so we invest. That's what we do, right? We find companies, we find them all over the world. We find most of them would be international. So 90%, they come from, like our last cohort, we had them from Spain, from Finland, from Argentina, from India, from Egypt, from Africa, from everywhere. And then we invest checks of $100,000 into those companies. And then we do follow-on investments of up to a million dollars and into those companies again, if we feel that they're doing really, really well. And then we just play the waiting game. You know, so it's about support and then wait. And if those companies turn into what we believe they can turn into, then we, as with everybody else who invests in early stage startup, have the ability of being able to get returns anything from, you know, 20 times to a thousand times on the companies. And if they do not do well, then we get nada. And that's the game. We are high stakes gamblers who have a little bit of insight to how the game is played. So how how many investments would you have at a given time? So actual deployed $100,000 checks at any given time, how many do you have? So we have 70 right now. And we will invest probably another you know, 10 companies between now and the end of December. So within the next three months. Uh, next year, we'll invest probably an additional 100 companies. And then the following year, I- I'm guessing we'll probably stay in the same trajectory. So my guess is probably another 100 companies then next year again. And that would put us on about probably live companies at that stage, somewhere between 200 and 250. And so of that percentage, and, and again, it's a numbers game for y'all. And, and mm-hmm. in the oil and gas private equity world, it was as well. In my book, What the Fuck is Wrong with Everybody Else? What They Didn't hmm. Teach You in Business School. There's a chapter called What You Need to Know About Money in the Ligers. And the learning of the ligers, which are the private equity investment people, of which you would be one, is that you guys control all of the rules. And as long as your statistics work out, then you can continue to invest, which is great for for founders because they would not otherwise be able to get access to the capital. And for y'all, out of the 250 companies you think that you'll have, how many will make it to the next level in your in your statistical modeling? So within early stage startups, so you're absolutely right in every single thing that you say. It, it is a game and the game has rules. And then like every other game, this is why I don't, this is why I don't ever put money in the stock market because I have no control of the rules. There's other people controlling the rule. What, like why would I want to play a game? But what folks don't realize in early stage startup is this is the case. And sometimes you will get an angel who'll come in and say, oh, I want to invest in a startup and I really like this person. I really like their idea. But it's like me investing in Apple, but I have no idea what's going to happen with Apple. And I have no control, no anything on it. So you need to be inside the game as opposed to outside the game. Now, we are at the very extreme of the game. So you've got the folks who are SoftBank, Sequoia, NEA, uh, Lightspeed, very, very large venture capital firms who have got billions of dollars under deployment. And because they're allocating so much money, they control the game 95%. The rest of us only control at 5% actually because we're on such an extreme stage. So I'm taking a company literally when they have their product built, when they just started bringing traction to market and they're saying, Brian, look at my first four customers. Look at what happens. You should believe that we should be able to do this four multiplied by a thousand. And to a certain extent, 
they're right, but there are lots of other things that are engaged in that game as well. So because we're taking folks in so early, then there's a feeling that our success rate should be somewhere between one in 10 and one in 20. That will make it all the way through. Now, what all the way through looks like is you have to go from pre-seed, which is where we get the companies and we're investing $100,000 checks to seed. Seed is where they'll raise somewhere between a million and $3 million, maybe on a valuation of about five to $8 million. Then they have to go from seed through to Sirius A. And Sirius A is where they're going to raise somewhere from $3 million to up as much as $10 million. And these days I've actually seen checks higher than that, probably on a valuation of 25 to $50 million. And then you've got your Series B. Series B can be anything from $20 million to $100 million Series B rounds that I've seen raised. And then you can go to Series uh, C, D, E, F, hell. I've even heard of G's going on these days. So we are right, right, right at the beginning. So yes, we are in the game. Yes, we control the rules. However, there is certainly a lot of skill that's required to be able to choose the winners because nobody who's really controlling the game would even dream of taking a position at this stage. So how many meetings a week do you have? And and I, I sort of tell this story to a lot of people, like when, when I was sort of at the tail end of my oil and gas career, but I was doing this part time, uh, I would have coffees. Everyone would reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter and say, hey, do you want to have coffee? And there was not a meeting I wouldn't have once. Now, are we going to become best friends and go have 30 meetings after? No, but I always feel like there's some there's value that people can have in that, in that exchange. So I had a lot of meetings, probably... 10 meetings a week, and I wasn't even trying to seed capital. You must have a multitude number of those meetings and then some. So how many meetings would you have with new teams, new people a week to try and figure out where you're going to invest some of these dollars? I would have six, six meetings a day with new companies. And my team, I've got one, one scout looking at the MENA region, one scout looking at the US, one scout looking at Israel, one scout looking at India, and one scout looking at the rest of the world. They would have seven to 10 meetings per day. And of the seven to 10 meetings per day, well, maybe they would probably average a five, I would say, if I'm gonna average it out, maybe five meetings per, per day per person. So that's another 25 meetings per day. And of that 25 meetings per day, so of their 25, I'm getting five. And of the 25 that they see, they're probably seeing one in 10 that they're receiving as an application. So yeah, there's a lot of people raising money. And if you were to give advice to people who were thinking about starting a business now of, of the, of the criteria you look at in the pitch, where in the, in the game. And, and the reason is a lot of people will call and say, Hey, I have this great idea for a business. It's I'm going to sell t-shirts online. Would you give me money? And I'm like, I mean, there's, it's so early. It's so early. I think that no. even be, the that's not to, no. the answer is okay. The answer to that is no. Yeah. So where does a, does a person get to in their proof of concept before they would have the first meeting with one of your scouts and then ultimately filter down to you? Yeah. So you have to start at the end before, before you can get to the beginning. So we, we, we call it island hopping, but before I even get to that, let me tell you the two different types of businesses there are. There is a venture back of a business and then there is a non-venture back of a business. And, and, and neither is better or worse than the other. They're just very different. So the non-venture back of a business is a business whereby you start it up and you say, Hey, you know what? This is an awesome watch. And I, I'm a great watchmaker and I've got these really, these, these 500 different color straps on the watches, which I'm going to put on and we're going to sell 50 million watches a year. And that is not a venture back of a business in general, because it's very service orientated. It's very manual. The scaling will be slow and you could get to like selling 50 million watches or maybe 5 million or 500,000 watches, but it's just going to take you a long time because you have to go through a process. You have to build up your brand, you have to get your prices right, you have to get a manufacturing chain. So it's very unlikely that something like that would be a venture back of a business. So something like this, as an investor, I would be slow to put money into because I know the return will take a long time. I know the scaling is going to be extremely slow. I know also that the failure rate is still relatively high but I probably wouldn't put it in. So founders for this types of business 
would start looking at Indiegogo maybe to get started or they might speak to friends and families and people that they know to give them a small stake in the business. And maybe they'll do joint ventures. Maybe they'll take other types of loans from, from non-bank sources. Now you have venture back of companies. Venture back of companies are companies that can reach a revenue, I mean, you can equate it into users as well, but let's just use revenue for easy math of $10 million per month within a five to a seven year period. Now, we all know that it might take 10 years to get to that type of level, but we want a company to be able to demonstrate that they can get there within five to seven years. Now, and I always say to people, and folks might listen and go, well, hang on, it's obvious we're going to go for a venture backable because you got really good revenue, it can grow really fast, um, and people are going to invest in your company. Yes, but you're also going to lose the majority of your company. Like by the time you get to the place you're going to get to, you will have more than likely single digits, maybe, maybe teens of a percentage ownership of your company left. You will not have 100% or 80 or 60 or 40 or even 20. And that's because every time you raise money, you're going to give away a third or 20% of your company. While in the other company where I'm making watches, you own that sucker all the way to the end. And if you're going to sell it, you might sell it for $50 million, but you own 40 million or 45 million of that $50 million. So you have to make a very conscious decision at the beginning. Do I want to start a business which is going to generate revenue, grow revenue, gather um, garner EBITDA so that I have profitability, which will be a lifestyle company that I can sell in the future and I will own the majority of it? Or do I want to take a business which will have no necessity whatsoever for profitability? Actually, it will be frowned upon. I will not own more than a tiny percentage of my company at the end. My board will be taken over by venture capitalists by the time I get to series B of what I've just gone through. And the likelihood of me being fired as CEO of my own company is about 65% based on statistics. Which do I want? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, so I love, I, I want to follow that line of thinking, but, but before we do, I want to go back and ask you, how did you get into this business? And, and, and were you on the other side of the table for a period of time? Had you started businesses? How did you end up as sort of the person collaborating 100 businesses together at 100,000 each, trying to figure out which one of the five to 10 was going to be successful to get onto that level? What, what was your background that brought you here? So I'm a traveler of the world. I, I left Ireland real young. I was probably 17, 18. I've lived in about 50 countries since then, um, everywhere from Russia and China and all the way throughout Europe and all the way throughout South America, most places in Southeast Asia. And I've just been extremely fortunate. I've been in the US for about 15 years. I've lived in Texas which really everybody in Texas just believe it is the entire US. But I've even, be, I've even lived outside Texas in the other US, right? So I've lived in New York, which is still my favorite place in the world. Um, you know, San Francisco, San Diego, Cambridge and Massachusetts, and now down here in Santa Monica. And throughout that entire journey, I've done a bunch of different things. I had a property development company um, almost straight out of school. Um, it wasn't huge, but it was big enough. I had about 10 or 15 properties at one stage. Um, I worked with a company called Christie's over in the UK, which gave me just this great knowledge about buying and selling. That's the auction house, if I'm yeah, right. right. Auction yeah. house, yeah. yeah. And they had a, a branch which was in property as well. So I dealt with a lot of businesses at that stage and valuing businesses and looking at them. And we had uh, public houses and residential homes and hotels and all kinds of great things. Um, so I just really became very smart with what value is. You know, if you're going to buy something and you're going to sell something, you've got to do something in the middle that's got to get additional value. And what does that something look like? And how does that user experience that's being expected by the consumer who's going to buy it, how does that affect the price and, and that whole value variance? So I, you know, I did that for a few years and then had a consultancy company throughout Europe and then got swallowed up by Regis. Uh, Regis, uh, the co-working space? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. um, help, help them expand in a number of different countries and then launched a tech uh, company myself over here, got bought out by my partner. And so I've been blessed, really. I've been blessed in the countries that I've lived in. I've been blessed in the companies that I've been involved with, whether it was with 
other folks or whether it was myself. And I arrived down here in Santa Monica after a really great time in New York. And I just noticed that a bunch of folks were failing and they were failing on a really high level. And nobody really talks about the failure rate within entrepreneurship. So I wanted to get engaged in that. I took on a, a super space that I'm in right now on top of the Santa Monica Mall at 10,000 square feet. And we just created a laboratory for entrepreneurs. And we brought the entrepreneurs in and we studied them and we watched them. And it, it was genuinely at that stage, it was a hobby nothing more. Um, and I made some investments into some of the companies, but it was a hobby. I, I really wanted to understand what made greatness tick and what made failure happen and more about failure happening. Because when we look at the 98% failure rate within America right now of early stage entrepreneurs, it is an absolute travesty. Um, and even if we look at the other end, who are some of the entrepreneurs who are making it, only because of their access to family money and their access to family friends or university friends who happen to be venture capitalists. What's happening is our great companies in America are disappearing and they're being replaced by patsies who are just easy to put in the unicorn throne. So I just wanted to understand this game a little bit more. I, I was an investor already um, and I wanted to see, hey, if I, if I, can, if I can impact that variant if i can actually start taking some of the great entrepreneurs and give them a nudge and start moving past the the elitist nature that currently sits within the venture capital space and help them just become great and so we so we we we, we had our our little laboratory which was an interesting experiment with about 100 companies and then we turned that into a venture studio then we did a few investments and then myself and my partner decided that we were going to formalize the whole thing and just create a fund and have that fund invest into the earliest stage companies. Um, and I would say the interesting part of our journey, we kind of had a, a three-step journey. Um, our thesis at the beginning is very similar to our thesis today. We want to take companies in the very earliest stages. Uh, we want to invest $100,000 checks in at the beginning. We want to have the ability to follow on with million-dollar checks within the first two to three years of the company's existence. Um, and we want to make a ton of money while at the same time having a higher success rate within our companies than elsewhere. It's not more unicorns necessarily. Hopefully that comes by extension, but we just want to have a higher extension, a higher success rate of our companies. And um, what was the interesting step was when I looked around the States and then I looked at the accelerators in the States and the, and the players in the States. And I thought it's going to be very difficult for us as a new player to come in and compete with the really dominant players like the white combinator or 500 startups, just great accelerators that are currently entrenched here. So we decided that we would use my unique skill and talent, which is my, my globalism. And we would create this as a bridge from the entire world into America. So we would use everything that's great. Yeah. No. So what I was going to ask was, so then the international element, which you emphasize, so it was you're identifying international companies that have, 10 million a month ideas that mm -hmm. would bring would would effectively focus on the u.s market and that's where you serve as the that's your niche that's your link so yep. it's not you're not looking for egyptian companies to help grow in the egyptian market though they might grow in the egyptian market you're looking for an egyptian company that has a unique idea that you think can get to 10 million a month within five to seven years and and they have a u.s focused business model yeah, that was our initial thesis, right? Okay. We thought, we thought, what are, what are we good at? We're really good at brand. We're really good at personal and business brand. What else are we good at? We're really good at marketing and growth hacking. And I mean like internet marketing, the, the, the kind where you go deep into funnels, automation, prediction, all of that awesome stuff. So we're really good at that. And we thought companies coming into America are not really good at that. So not only will we give them a check, but we will also facilitate their entry into the market and make it really simple. And then that was our, so that was our first theory, right? And then our next one was, okay, we build a program, we put it in place and let's find the best entrepreneurship nation in the world to start with so we can get some easy wins. And we went to Israel, which you would think would be a no brainer. But what we found was that fish, that, sorry, that pond had been fished for the last 20 years. Right. So we were so late to that party, the lights were off. You know, the house was closed down. The music was gone. There was no more drinks left. Like it was over. And even mediocre entrepreneurs over there now have so much access to great investment opportunities that little old expert dojo were never going to stand a chance. So we went over there. We found a couple of nice guys and gals. Um, but then we decided really quick, hang on, let's rather than 
following where everybody else has gone. Let's look at where the trends of tomorrow are. And there's some interesting things happening in Europe, yeah. And there's some interesting things happening in Israel, of course. We, we still love Israel. Um, but is there an opportunity for us in these established and well-prepared markets? Not at all. So then we started looking at Africa. And really fascinating things started to happening. And we started making investments in Africa. And we, one of our companies we invested in less than a year ago, Star News, they already have 5 million subscribers and growing. We think there'll be at 20 million subscribers by the end of next year. A company we just invested in in India, which, which ticks exactly. Ray Dalio had wrote this great book on previous empires and future empires. Yeah. So really fascinating, right? And the only thing he really did was just transcribed what had been in place from many, many other publications. And pretty much what it says is it tracked the Ottoman Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the Spanish Empire, back in like the 14, 1500s. And then it tracked China then glow, growing as a global nation. And then it tracked its demise. And then it tracked its rise again. And if you watch all of these companies going up and down, and then you watch the US, and you look at the US at least up until about 20 years ago, and the US was a hockey stick growth. So now what's happening is this. Number one, we're losing that. As a market, we're going down, which means we have to bring in fresh talent. So in some ways, without, without dramatizing this, I see us as part of a movement to save America within entrepreneurship. So how, how many American companies do you fund? And, and not just because, uh, you know, and, and I hear what you're saying, so I want to explore that, but of the total number of 70 companies you have invested in, how many are American-based building the American market? So there are three types of American companies, right? There are the American companies, which are American Americans. They're not immigrants. They're not anything. They're just based here. And that's probably around 20 companies. I don't have the exact number, but it might be 20 or 25 companies, um, but a reasonable amount. And then we have immigrants that are already based here but that are, they consider themselves American. The company's already registered as an American company. That would be another 25 companies. And then here's the third part of our thesis, which we didn't expect, uh, which was really fascinating, was that we went to, and let me give you like, take the African one as, I'll give you an African one and an Indian example, because both are equally fascinating, right? The African one is this company, Star News, what they do is they facilitate the distribution of influencer content by famous Africans to non-famous Africans, to normal people through mobile phones. Now, why is that super relevant? Number one, they have an exclusive agreement with Orange and other mobile phone carriers. So they can get all of this information into the user's hands at no cost and with a revenue share. Number two, Africa doesn't have apps. So all of the confusion that we have on our phone here with thousands of apps on the phone where, hey, I want to be the next TikTok. Well, so do 5,000 other apps. So every, all of the consumer's attention is, divert, is, is dispersed everywhere except for a few very choice apps. You don't have that problem in Africa. You have a telephone number. Okay. In that case, you can get the influencer content. It's that simple. So these guys grew incredibly quickly. Like, I don't want them in the U.S., like we help them with their brand in the US, we help them grow, we help them get stronger, but really it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal opportunity over in Africa. Um, another great example is over in India, which is a company called Unlu that we took in our last accelerator cohort. I truly believe they would be a unicorn within three years. They do, they do exactly the same. If you know what Cameo do over here and Masterclass do over here, Cameo is they, they facilitate influencers it just so happens these two are influencer platforms. Actually, it's a, it's a small segment for us, but both of these are very fast growing in the same space. But Cameo over here, like if you're Joe Pesci, Joe Pesci would be on the platform and Joe Pesci would wish some random person happy birthday, right? And then that random person would give him like 200 bucks. But Joe Pesci might say, hey, happy birthday. And like, and if you don't take care of your mom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna be sleeping in the bottom of the ocean tomorrow, you know? And then, and you'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Joe Pesci just wished me happy birthday. And it only took Joe Pesci like, five minutes to do it and he made 200 bucks and then you add all of this together and you realize there's a lot of celebrities that can make a couple of thousand dollars an hour and there's a lot of folks who can get it what's the problem with cameo they're all c plus and b minus level influencers so these guys in indio took a copy and paste of cameo but with a level influencers 
And then they took masterclass, which is direct training from influencers to normal folks. And they, they integrated that to the platform too. And they're absolutely killing it. And they did 50 grand in their first month in revenue. They're expected to do $100,000 a month by month four. And I think they'll be doing a million dollars a month by the end of next year. Okay, so so when they came to you with that idea, which which sounds again, it's like a brilliant idea, and I'm I'm also shocked that there are thirty meetings a day that you and your team are having around potential businesses that people believe could be ten million dollar a month. I mean that that level of entrepreneurship is incredible to believe that every business is this hockey stick. That's shocking. But when these guys came to you and said, "Okay, here's my idea." had they got proof of concept? Where were they in the stage of development when they said, I need your 100,000 for me to within four months get to 50,000 revenue and within 12 months be at a million? Obviously it's done better than they expected. So, but. so these guys were actually not built yet, but there was a couple of things we really like. Look, there's one word in startup that matters and that's execution. We all, we all, we'd all like to be rich, but most of us aren't prepared to do what it takes to be rich. We'd all like to be the Wimbledon champion or, you know, win an NFL ring, but we don't have what it takes to be able to do it, right? So we're looking for the talent, we're looking for the skill, and we're looking for the mentality. Um, and these guys were very impressive to me. Number one, they had a couple of exits between them before. So they'd been on this road. You're not big ones, but small ones, enough to give them the taste of blood. Number two, they were very well balanced in the different disciplines. So four founders, one in the, in the talent space, another one in um, the uh, tech space, another one in the logistics space, another one in the sales space, right? So very, very, very strong team. They'd also had the makings of a great platform. Plus they already had a bunch of influencers online. So at that stage, we're saying, okay, it's a risk, but what does this sector look like? Really good, super, super um, uh, well done and, and successful in the United States. The India is a much bigger market than the United States. The they people are, forget that. It's 1.3 billion people. Yeah, and they are fanatical about sports. They love their sports and their personalities. Like they make us look like we don't care. And they are going so, so, all that needs to happen is that the product needs to be implemented properly. So we invested the money in them. We worked with them on their investment strategy. They oversubscribed on their round. Uh, with American investors, we put a bunch of American investors into it. Like it doesn't matter. Look, from my, my way of looking at it, I think we'll, we'll continue with the fact of 80% of all of our founders will end up in the US. The companies will end up in the US. We'll build the businesses in the US. But the few that we get where it's just like, it's an African play, then we make sure that the investors in the US can make money out of those as well. So no matter which way, it still flows back here. Or we just, uh, I'll give you a really interesting example. We just took a company in from Egypt and they created a platform whereby doctors all around the world are on the platform and they can provide surgeon, surgeries to folks who need surgeries. Now, you might think, well, okay, well, that's, that's good. And here in the US, it's more attractive than even some other places. But even for non for non-invasive surgery or for surgeries whereby they wouldn't be mandatory like LASIK surgeries. You can get a LASIK done on an American machine by a doctor who is probably trained in America or maybe even trained better for 300 bucks. And if I'm gonna do it over here, it's gonna be 10,000 bucks. Like I want, I want the access, that type of thing. So those guys hit the market. They did $15,000. We, we saw them when they had done $15,000 in revenue. We liked what they were doing. We looked at the cost to customer acquisition. We looked at the market and we looked at the opportunities in the MENA region. They did um, 30,000 in their next month. They did 100,000 in their next month. And in the first six days of this month, they've done $48,000. So there's just a big badass world out there. And the thing about ideas is that with 7 billion people on the planet, actually there's a lot of stuff from cybersecurity companies to AI companies to, to uh, uh, driverless car companies that have the ability to be able to do $10 million a month in revenue. So when, when you, I, I wanna go back to the beginning of your career, when you said you got out of school, I'm curious, cause I know the UK model is different. I have a friend from Ireland and I have a lot of squash friends cause I grew up playing squash from the UK. And there wasn't the same push to go to this Ivy League school, this university, there were trade schools, people took years off. Did you go through a college system or did you come right out hungry to get working and build your career from there? You know, I'm really torn on college. I, I would have loved to have gone to college. 
I would have loved to have gone because I think I would have had so much fun. So I don't equate college personally to learning. It's it's such a, uh, and it's very biased because. I I agree with you. And that's why I wanted to ask the question. But I do think you have so much fun there. And and with my personality, I would have made so many friends and I would have had such great memories. And I, I may have not have made it through it alive, but I would have had a fantastic time. Do I regret not going? I think if I had the choice again, I would go, I think. Um, but I was traveling throughout Europe and learning about things that... So what happened in life was this. As I, as I started out, obviously with the property development and everything, I made a ton more money than all of my friends who were going to college and going to other places. And then what happened was most of my friends who went to college did MBAs and they just shot up and suddenly they're making like 200 grand a year. And then I was going through trying to build my next thing and I'm way down again. So they're suddenly way up here. And now having come through it at the end, you know, I'm in pretty good shape. I think I've got a really good learn. And now I'm really torn. I have a 13 year old and literally myself and my wife are in this conversation right now where myself, my business partner, absolutely. He went to Penn state and he absolutely does not believe in college. One single bit. He believes you got to start a company. He said he actually believes very similar to Ray Dalio, who uh, Ray Dalio. And then also, um, uh, Guy Kawasaki, who's brilliant at this as well, that the problem with school and college is it just it teaches you how to adapt to slavery. So it teaches you how to work for somebody else and then to, to stay in debt for your entire life and not get out of it. The great thing about startup and entrepreneurship is that it teaches you how to have a better relationship with money. And that relationship with money is about generational wealth. It is not about trying to earn enough so that we can make it through to the end. It's about how do I build something which is so incredibly awesome that I can start moving from the game of I'm earning money and I'm paying taxes to I'm acquiring stuff and I'm paying tiny amounts of taxes to I'm acquiring stuff and providing cash flow and not paying any taxes. Like that's that's what nobody understands. And I don't think college gives that to you. I think college reinforces the sense of brotherhood and sisterhood of everybody working in a company together and just making it happen. Well, think about, I mean, just as an example, the Donald Trump thing. Now, I haven't read his tax returns, but clearly that has been the big thing. And that like all of society, notwithstanding, they're trying to pick and do with this thing. But like when I hear about a business person not paying taxes, it's because they've generally invested so much that their depreciation is so high that they've kicked the can down the road but as you know you know you sell an asset you 1031 into something else you then this you then that you grow like there's lots of ways and i don't want to call it avoiding taxes but you are you are delaying the bill and using the compounding effect of not paying taxes to build a bigger thing and you're totally right people don't think about the fact that most super wealthy people made it post their you know startup and they've They've invested in other things. They've kept their money and Bill Gates isn't involved in Microsoft anymore, but he's doing okay. You know, it, it, it just, it just grows so much and you can't have a salary to build generational wealth. You need to build no. something to do that. No. And it's also leverage as well, right? If you look at what's happening in the world today with the SPACs um, and the, this, <laughs> like the yeah, SPACs. They're, are they crazy to you? They must be crazy to you. They're crazy to me. But it's if it's a real, it just explains. It's it explains so well the point that I'm just making, which is that there's so much money. We're in a world of absolute scarcity, where most people today are thinking, I don't know how to pay my rent. I don't know how to pay my mortgage. I've got. I, I, do I eat or do I go for a drink or do I feed my child? Like they're you're being faced with choices we never thought we would have had before. And then right on the other side of the spectrum, there's a guy saying, so here's what we're gonna do. We just need like, can we have $4 billion, please? We don't know what we're going to do with it, but I promise you, I promise you, Scout's Honor, that it's going to be good, okay? But give me the $4 billion and I'll get back to you on what we're going to use it for. And everybody's like, yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll do that. Because That's the best description of a SPAC <laughs> I've ever heard and I love it so much. Because <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. And it just explains how the world works. Like There's money around if you understand leverage and you understand that money is a tool. It is no more and no less than a tool. And if you can use that tool properly, it is almost impossible to lose money. It's only when you're afraid of money and you, you enter in with a fear mindset, which is what most people do. 
they're terrified of losing it. And because they're so terrified of losing it, it's no different than being terrified of losing a relationship. There's only one way it's going to go. So look, I, I just, I, I really hope, one of my hopes actually, look, this whole venture capital thing that we do, we would like to think that we can make an impact on venture capitalists. We would like to think that more females will get funded due to folks like us getting in, that more folks of diversity will get funded because of us getting in, that the world will become a more international and wonderful place and that we can just move away from the silliness of, uh, of, of, of just making everything so much about, you know, folks need to be of a certain type and look and feel to be able to be successful. Right? I would like to think that I am not naive enough to believe that we will make that impact in venture capitalism or I think we'll make a little dent and I think we'll be very successful because of the companies we're investing in and I think we'll do just fine. But my hope is that we will then take those hundreds of millions of dollars that we will make from what we're doing and then we will be able to throw it into our real passion, which is to change the entire schooling system and educational system and actually make it all about entrepreneurship, like none of it about the stuff that's in there right now. Like I want my kid, my kid like lives in our accelerator which means that all he sees all day, every day are entrepreneurs starting and building businesses. He learns from the, like, that's what I want kids to go through. So do you have, have people, when you talked about the cohort and you talked about the study of the 98%, are people physically there? What's the expectation as part of the accelerator? Are they there for a day a week? Uh, are they zooming into you? What, what kind of access do they have to you and your team? And, and how, like, how does that exactly work? And then second part of that, which you can answer after is of the 98% failure, what was the common thread that you think that you've now found the secret sauce to have less than 98 and make it 96. So you're doubly as successful. So we are, I mean, so first let's talk about COVID because COVID has actually changed everything. And like our model was very simple. We get on a, um, we get a cohort, we get 12 companies, we make 12 investments. We then bring them into Expert Dojo on top of our lovely place in Santa Monica. Uh, we then bring them through an eight week grueling boot camp where we work with them on building their brand, building their personal brand, building their vision, making sure we bring in growth hackers and marketing folks and, and, and more investors than they can swing a stick at. And then hopefully what happens is they then get to the end of that and they raise a rent beyond our rent, maybe a million dollars. And actually our cohort, two cohorts ago, um, we've six of the 12 companies have, have oversubscribed on their rounds, right? So, so, it, so it, it was, it's a very, and I won't say a standard process because hardly anybody goes to that type of depth that we go to, but the process is an understood process of how it works for an accelerator. And then COVID came in March, which meant that we couldn't bring anyone in here, which means that I'm in a, a 10,000 square foot facility where nobody's allowed to come in because we're stuck in this whole COVID situation. And we thought this was going to really, really affect us as a company and how we were actually going to be and how we were going to survive. And here's a couple of things that happened. Like number one, previously, we would have four events a week here. We were the absolute hub of entrepreneurship here in Santa Monica. And, and everything that was happening was going to happen here. And even in Southern California, so events stopped. Number two, we moved our entire cohort remotely. And what happened was, number one, I realized that events are a total waste of time that have no value whatsoever and nobody gets anything from them. Nobody builds a business from them. The only you just thing get that, drunk. You get drunk and you get free pizza and you get to feel how cool it is to be a startup, right? But it's a total waste of time and it's a diversion of strengths and skills into the wrong place. And also, Zooms and everything are way more efficient. And our, also our cohort, which I, if you'd have said to me last year, could we possibly do an online cohort? I'd be like, no, you need to, I need to touch them and feel them. Uh, it's way better. Our cohorts are better. Everything is online. Everything is now about trying to build those relationships and get everybody in all these different countries working together in their country and in the US as well. So it's been really great. And, 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 and I hope it continues exactly as it is. And we now have our model whereby we'll do, as I said, the 50 companies this year. And then next year, we will probably do a cohort in the morning and a cohort in the afternoon. And we'll do 12 companies in each cohort. And we'll just continue rolling them out. And so of the 98% failure rate, so that's 2% success. So you double that. How, how, what do you see as the common thread of failure or conversely, you talked about execution is the common thread of success. I, I totally agree. And you have to have hunger and it's people, but it's more than just people. So I'm curious what you learned examining those, com those companies. Right. So 
first of all, when we had everybody in here and we were looking to try and see what were the, what were the characteristics that were causing a problem? So I'll, I'll do that and then we'll move into our investment thesis ourselves. Um, so the number one thing was, you know, America is the greatest storytelling nation on the planet. Nobody does what America does, but we've started to forget how to storytell. And, and that happened when philosophies like Lean Startup came out and people started to realize, actually, when you start a company, you should just get it out to market and try and see if people hate it. And that's not the way that we, that we used to start businesses. We used to start businesses like we created a movie. You know, there has to be a hero. The hero has to be in the making. The fans have to love the hero. And then at the end, you want the hero to live forever right? And that's why the movie is loved. You can't just get and say, hey, you know, I was going to give you the first half of the movie, but you know what? Here's the hero. Here's a couple of lines about him. He won. Is that cool? And, and, that's, and that's kind of what's happened. And, and, and the end result of that is it means that everybody just grows based on Facebook ads. Like that becomes the entire differentiator between Uber and 5,000 other companies that are doing exactly the same thing. So that's a huge, huge, huge issue. Then the second thing that we found is that people are just looking for investment. That's just the very first thing they ask for is, hey, I'm starting a company. I've got an idea. I'd like to actually get some investment, please. And it's like, well, why should you get investment? You haven't done anything. So the relationship between investors and folks looking to build companies became this toxic relationship of this give and this want. And, 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 and that's not the way it should be. The next point that we saw was that there was a, a predetermined type of startup that was getting all of the money and everybody else was not getting the money. So even if we found great startups, because there was a very elitist effect within the startup uh, ecosystem, the great startups were not necessarily getting it through. So then we step back and we're like, okay. So we know, number one, elitism only wins until greed and FOMO take it over. But once greed and FOMO take it over, then nobody wants to be a lead. Suddenly, nobody's loyal to anyone. So, for example, if you see a company, let's take Hagendas and Benny Jerry's as a great example. Like Hagendas is the is the the queen and the king of ice cream forever. Nobody's going to break through until Ben and Jerry's got the grassroots folks. Once Ben and Jerry's got the grassroots folks and real people saw a real brand with real messaging and important things behind it, suddenly they soared. And now try going into a store and seeing who's got more in there, Ben and Jerry's or haagen Ben and Jerry's just dominated. So for us, we knew that we needed to find founders who are beasts in their space. Like they will come in and they will take on anyone, fist to fist, face to face, when it's right to do it face to face and they'll break through and they, they will have shown that execution skills within previous things they've done, not necessarily startups, but within previous things they've done. And we want to be able to see if we can a little bit of traction so that we can just tell is the product fit right. So then we have perfect product fit, which is done really well, meets exceptional execution, meets phenomenal timing. So why is Cameo a really good one for us to go out? The one for Cameo in India? Because Cameo is killing it over here. So why would we not do an exact copy and paste, take it over there, make it more successful, reach the metrics that it took them 18 months to reach in six months and just build a unicorn by the numbers? Like, so all of those things became really important to us when it built it. But without the phenomenal execution ability of the, of the founder, we don't take them. Let's talk about California for a second. And the reason I want to raise it is, you know, two high profile celebrities have, have, have made the announcement, Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan, and mm -hmm. then arguably Elon Musk with moving some manufacturing for Tesla to, to Texas. When you think about you being based in Santa Monica and what you've learned about online and high rent and California and Silicon Valley, and could you be an incubator in rural West Virginia, as an example, because the tax regime is low, the cost of living is low, your core team it all wants to be there and hike and fish and go check out old coal mines? Or do you really feel like there's an exceptional thing about the Californian culture that irrespective of tax rates, it gives you the access to grow these companies that you wouldn't otherwise have? So you need the chain to be able to bring the, 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 the ship, drag the ship or the boat or whatever you're going to be dragging your unicorn in with, right? You need a full chain. And that chain means that the investment from the pre-seed all the way to the series A, B, C, D, E, or E 
needs to be in place. So the problem with Ohio is there's no later stage investment. I know everybody's going to say from Ohio, hold on, and what the hell? There's Jimmy and Jimmy. Were, yeah, but there's not. It's not the Valley. It's not San Francisco. It's not here. It's not New York. It's not Boston. It's not Chicago. There are certain hubs in the United States where all of the money is. And this is a little bit like to, to our really interesting conversation at the beginning, which is that relationship with money, is that Wherever the money is, is where you have to start because Uber are not the top ride hailing company in the United States because they have a great value proposition or because they have a great product or even because they have a good product. Actually, they have a terrible product. They haven't made money in 12 years and they have no probability of making money in the next five or 10 years. Now, every investor in Uber will say that's rubbish. But in a year's time, I'll bet you 50 bucks they won't have made money. <laughs> and in five years' time, I'll actually double that to 100 bucks and tell you they still won't have made money. So why are they a monster unicorn with a huge valuation? Because the money has decided to crown them king and queen. So you have to be where the money is. It's very, look at uh, what O'Shea did in Vegas. Nothing, right? And it wasn't his fault. Like he went to Vegas and he's like, and he's like, okay, I'm going to go to Vegas. He'd done great with Zappos. I'm going to turn Vegas into the next great hub. Then they funded, they seeded all these small companies at the beginning. And then it's like, okay, so where's everybody else? There's nobody. And so the, the chain analogy I love. So, so part of your value proposition for these companies, not only are you bringing the 100,000 seed investment for a good idea, not only are you giving them an eight week boot camp, but on top of that, you have access through your network to the next round plus whoever invests in you. And so that allows them to have confidence that if they need a $10 million round, you can do it. And so that is Correct. your value proposition for being in California. So you would say kind of bollocks to all these people saying, well, there's going to be this big exodus from California because it is empirically, it is probably the nicest climate in the entire country. Sure. Um, I'm in a t-shirt. I'm in a t-shirt. I only have t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be very hard to leave. And so you're saying, I kind of call, it's a nice idea. Tax rates go up one or 2%, whatever. We get enough tax credits through our startup businesses that we'll just, we're not really worried about it. So you think that it will remain what it is, even with COVID where you see Google and not the Microsoft space there, but these Twitter are saying you can work remotely, you can work from home, you can live from anywhere. And we're going to stop doing the cost of living adjustment to your salary. So if you want to live in rural Pennsylvania, cool, you can work there, but we're going to lower your salary, which has the net impact of lowering their GNA, which is presumably how many, good. Uh, how many large venture capitalists have we seen leave Silicon Valley? Zero. Nobody. There's nobody's leaving. Nobody's leaving. Nobody's going anywhere. Um, I, I mean, I will. What's What's really interesting about the world that we're in is, is is absolutely about those relationships and making sure the chain's in place. If you say to me, "What is the most valuable part of what we do? What are the most valuable parts in order of of uh, importance?" I would say. Number one, strategy. We're exceptional strategists and we really work with the vision. That's because we bring in some awesome people at the beginning of the accelerator. Number two, I would say our focus and our aggression on growth hacking and growth in general is extremely powerful and startups need to learn that and they need to build a really strong relationship with that. Number three, I would then say the connections, the experts, the mentors, the folks that we have around Expert Dojo who will all get behind their business would run. And then I would say number four is the fact that we know every single investor in the US, which means that we're going to help you get your follow-on money. And then number five would be, hey, we'll give you 100K. If you ask the startups what is the most important from, from, from their perspective for Expert Dojo, they would say the follow-on investment, then our 100K. <laughs> then our they, would, they would go reverse. So, so wait, what, what can you do, right? So, so react to this statement, and then I have one more. Actually, I have two more questions for you, but react to this. So when I wrote the book, and obviously I came up in an oil and gas background, which is a very, very capitally intensive business. And yeah. if you wanted to have a startup in... 2008 to 2016, 17, you needed a minimum of $100 million. Yep. The bigger ones were getting $300 million. And when I wrote my book in 2012, there's a chapter that says, if you have to pick up the phone more than once to raise money, you shouldn't be raising money. And it was sort of a message to the would-be entrepreneurs in oil and gas that had an idea about a basin and they were an engineer and they had a geologist that was a friend and they had a <laughs> CFO and they liked drinking together and they wanted to be rich. 
So they wanted to figure out. So they would ask and they'd be like, where do, who do I call? And I'm like, if you don't know who to call, and more importantly, if they don't know that you're, that you would be doing this and they're not calling you or they're not ready for that investment, it's, you probably shouldn't be raised money. Don't quit your day job. But California is so different because it's a totally different culture. You need a hundred thousand. You don't need a hundred million. It's different. How would you react to the statement that I just said? So I was on a, uh, I was on a panel uh, about, about a year or so ago and a startup said to a head of an angel group on the panel, I'm looking to raise money. How can I get access to your group? And the angel said, so you don't get just access to our group because we'll choose you. But he said, what you want to do is you want to like reach out to Janice and Janice would be the front door. And then you want to reach out through Henry because Henry's important in the group. And then you want to reach out through this person. And then you want to reach out through this and there. And if you spend all your time doing that, then there's a possibility that we look at you. And then it kind of came down to me and they said, well, what do you suggest? And I'm saying, well, well, every single person who does that are the types of people that we don't want. So for me, there's like two types of people in this world. There are pussies and then there are people who are focused on doing the type of things that need to be done to be successful. And if you're spending your whole time begging people for money, then you're not going to be able to spend your whole time executing. So you need to be an exceptional fundraiser, but an exceptional fundraiser is someone who is hardly even noticed to be fundraising. They are so good at fundraising that they are making sure that everybody knows about all of the things that they're doing, but they are spending, it's not that they spend 80% of their time on fundraising or 80% of their time on building their business. They do both. They do 80% on fundraising and 80% on building their business because they work all those extra hours with the 80% on fundraising is so subtly beautiful that people are asking to invest in their company. And I'll give you, I'll go back to the company Unlu that I mentioned over in India. When that company were raising, we specifically decided to do a round of only $300,000. And we did a round at a low valuation of $4 million. And we specifically went out to all of the angels and said, look, these guys are going to be oversubscribed. They're going to hit 50 grand in revenue in their first month. We are personally out there already raising, getting ready for their next raise at $13 million. And remember, I'm saying this, not them. I'm saying we're already getting ready for the $13 million valuation that we're going to put on these guys. And we are going to do a tiny raise at the beginning so we can boost the revenue. I don't even know if I can get you in now. And then all of these people then had subsequent meetings with these folks. And I literally had a phone call from a guy in Boston who called me up and he's like, Brian, you know, these people, they're not accepting my 25 K check. They're telling me that they'll only accept a 50 and they can't even guarantee if they'll take it for a 50, but they'll add me onto the list. That's the kind of company that you want to be. You want to be that company. Like, don't be that person. Don't beg for money. Don't say, Oh, please give me some money. Be the one who's going to do it either way. Like I want you, I'll say, sorry, last thing I'll say is like, I want you not to give a shit if I give you money or not. Like it's my loss. I just missed out on a unicorn. And, and that is, I think that that is a great paraphrase of exactly what I'm saying, which is you need the network and you need people to know what you're doing, but you can't be that guy that when you walk in a room, everyone wants to run away because they know you're going to ask them for money. I think that you characterize that so much better. So you said something very early in the interview that said, we actually don't want the companies to be profitable. I might have misheard you, but I'm pretty sure I picked that up, which is ironic in, in the Tesla who only makes profit because they sell carbon credits, which is hilarious. Um, or in the Uber where cumulatively they lost so much money or Regis's competitor, even though Regis was valued at, I believe, $3 billion, we work wanted a $47 billion because they weren't service as a, as a um uh, what, what is it? Software as a service. They were space as a service, which Amazing. somehow made commercial real estate sexy again. So I am curious about the profitability comment, because clearly companies should have to make a profit at some point, don't they? Yeah, they should. And by the way, and it's causing us a problem as a nation, because what's happening is we're just birthing a lot of companies that are not expected to meet the fundamental basic results of business. And um, I personally love, look, if we can get a company that can make profitability, I personally love it. I feel like somehow I'm not wasting my life, 
just just creating these companies of uselessness. But but the United States right now, the institutional investment system does not want companies to make profits. If they see companies making profits, they believe that they are then wasting money, which should be used to drive more revenue. They believe that they're not being aggressive enough on the marketing because the idea is for the company to get to be doing revenue of ten billion dollars per ten million dollars per month. I'm sorry. So, but but the problem is this: like I I, I was actually okay with the philosophy at the beginning. The, the philosophy was let's take companies. This was like twenty years ago. Let's take companies and let's focus everything on growth. And growth means that they'll dominate their market. Dominating their market means they'll force the competition out of the market. And that will mean that they'll own the entire market. And that will mean that they can become profitable and they can become great companies, AKA Microsoft or Facebook, right? But what started to happen is that people have kind of lost sight of that profitability element. Like they've remembered all of the pieces that were amended in the middle, but they've forgotten the bit at the end. So if we look at like Casper, the mattress company that's gone like, you're like, come on, they, they, they make mattresses for God's sake. They make friggin' mattresses. Like how is this a venture back of a company? And by the way, they spent like $400 million on marketing. Or but, but Brian, it's, it's sleep as a service. It's a whole new thing. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. It's a SaaS business. <laughs> it's now, probably going to be a SPAC. <laughs> oh, it will be a spec. Okay, so if you could go back to yourself 20 years ago and give yourself advice, so you're 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 your same personality, you know you well, knowing everything you've learned over the last 20 years, what would you tell yourself or another younger person who has a similar personality as you that would help accelerate your life and career that you didn't know then? I would have started a company at the age of 17. I would have started three companies at the age of 17. I wouldn't have left Ireland. I'm actually, Ireland's a bad example because it's such an unentrepreneurial nation because the government is so particularly shitty. So it's tough. Like it is good to get access to the world. And actually I would not change the traveling and the global access I had because it was a gift. It was just a gift from heaven. I can't even, I can't even explain how important it is to get perspective, to know what consumers really want and know what the world really is. Um, but I would have definitely started stuff like really early, I, like at the beginning, what the heck? Like I'm in my mom's kitchen. I have no overheads. I got no family. I got no mortgage. I got no hassles. My life is easy. And the world is full of opportunities. There are so many great companies out there ready to be started. There are companies that you can copy. There are companies that you can invent. There are companies like there's everything with eBay. There's hundreds of thousands of companies on eBay alone. And then even if, forget venture Backable companies. Even if it took me 15 years to get that company to success, I'm 35 and I'm retired. So I would say to every single person listening, get out of the mindset of making money and trying to see if you can pay for the stuff that's going to be more expensive every year. I was at a stage where literally we were spending over a million dollars in a year and, and somehow I owed money. Like somehow, I and, and, and it may sound ridiculous to some people listening. And then there would be other people who are listening who would be like, yeah, dude, I did the same. I mean, like made 400 grand and I spent like 390,000 and I got 10,000 in my bank. And if I get fired tomorrow, my monthly overheads are $35,000. I'm bankrupt in two months. And that's because at that time, all of us, including me, were chasing money because we had a bad relationship with money. If I was going to go from me to back then now, oh man, I would be a superstar in three years because I would understand about the leverage that money allows me to do. It is merely a tool. So how do people get in touch with you? No, and again, I think the caveat here, and if you weren't listening, I'm going to repeat, which is you can't just call them with an idea and say, invest in me because that is not a thing and you have to be the right person. But that being said, if someone wants to either, I don't know if you take outside investors or, or where the, the money comes from in terms of how you fund Expert Dojo, but how do people follow you, get in touch with you, follow you on social media, talk to your scouts, learn more about you? Great. Well, so number one, so we don't take any money from outside. It's just myself and my partner. Um, but we do, we, we love follow on investors. So anybody who likes the deals that we're doing and saying, hey, we want to get access to your deals and get an insider access into Silicon Valley, 
then awesome. We love that and we take nothing from it. We don't want any money from it or any carry or anything else. We just want to be able to bring in great investors into the startup. So they can always reach out to me at brian at, at expertdojo.com. Um, startups, we interview every single startup we bring through and we throw them on the podcast. So anybody we invest in. So if you want to learn like what were their characteristics and what, what were their lessons and things that they had on the way, then you know you can jump onto our on to our podcast and listen to it on the site. Uh, if you believe that you have something which has the potential to scale really quickly, then you, please come on to expertdojo.com. Our application process is there. If you've applied and you want to make sure that we got it and I forward it on to someone just because you're on the show here with David, then you can just email me as well at brian at expertdojo.com and I'll make sure that you're fast tracked through to a decision, whether it's a yes or whether it's a no. Um, and then otherwise, there's so many great people to follow out there who speak exactly this language of builds generational wealth. Do it as early as you possibly can. Don't harm people. Don't do anything illegal. Don't do anything immoral, but build something great for yourself so you can take all of this horrible financial pressure off your lives. Then, you know, just go and do it. I love that advice. And with that, that is the end of our show. That was phenomenal. I did not know what to expect in this conversation, but I must say it is the most enjoyable one I've had, perhaps because it's so far outside my comfort zone. So thank you so much for joining, Brian. I wish you the best of luck and I look forward to staying in touch with you. Thanks, buddy. Until next time, be safe, be good, have a great day, and bye from now.